Good morning, everyone. It's about 8 o'clock. Uh, my name is Lee Ferguson. I'm the new first year resident here at the John A. Moran Center. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the three presenters for this morning's Grand Rounds. The first presenter is Dr. Brent Betts, and his talk will be about unknown corneal lesion. All right. First off, I want to thank our patient for coming in early this morning, and she's also here today to hopefully hear some discussion that we have about this uh, interesting case that we have. So this is a case that uh, has seen most of the cornea service. Um, the chief complaint presenting was there was a bump on the patient's left eye. The history is she's a 26-year-old female. Lesion started as a white dot about a year and a half ago now. Um, she did have surgery to remove the lesion, which I'll go into a little bit later, um, a year ago. But in the past six months, it's grown back with a vengeance. Um, her vision, she reports, has been blurring her left eye during the last three months. She denies any eye pain, any redness, minimal <coughs> irritation. She does have difficulty wearing contacts, and, and like I said, that we're the, the fourth opinion that she sought for this lesion. Past medical history is pretty insignificant when you uh, see her eye issue. Examination, she's 20-30 right eye, 20-50 left eye. She's a contact lens wearer. You can see she's a high myope. Um, she does have some irregular stigmatism in the left eye, limiting her vision. But everything else is pretty unremarkable, including her IOP. Uh, anterior segment examination with slit lamp. Um, you'll see the photo of her left cornea, but everything else was unremarkable. Uh, we did not do a fundus exam on her at our visit. So here's the slit lamp photos. Um, she, did have, she did have her contact lens in, so um, you can't appreciate fully, but I'll try to explain some pertinent points here. Um, but you can see here she has this lesion of her uh, inferior nasal quadrant. Measures about five millimeters vertically by four millimeters into the uh, visual, near the visual axis. Um, you can kind of see there might be, you know, some, a little bit more prominent vasculature at the limbus where the lesion is growing. And here's a co close-up shot, but you can see it's kind of this yellowish color. Um, at the leading edge, it appears that there's some kind of crystalline or lipid uh, de deposition. One thing that's hard to appreciate because she has her contact lens in, but actually when you get into the cornea, there's actually clear cornea over the top of this lesion, so you can appreciate that's fairly deep into the stroma. And there's, you can appreciate the lipid keratopathy here, and then here again. We did anterior segment OCT, and you can kind of see here, it looks like the anterior stroma and the epithelium is intact and fairly normal over the deep stromal lesion. Um, I actually, when she came this morning, I did gonioscopy on her, and and the lesion is either full thickness or it's, it bows in the peripheral cornea, um, but it's not invading the angle at all. Here's some tomography. You can appreciate she has quite a bit of astigmatism centrally, and you can see her posterior float uh, is really um, bowed in uh, where the lesion is located. Um, so her past ocular history, we got great notes from where she was treated in San Diego by a prominent cornea specialist. She was evaluated first in May 2015 down there. There's kind of this described as like a red spot by her cornea for two months previously and felt that sometimes it was hitting her lower lid. Um, she was treated with medications over the next two months and you can see she had topical steroids, oral NSAIDs, oral um, corticosteroids, none of which changed the size or shape of the lesion. And then she was also treated with um, valacyclovir due to concern for you know, maybe some kind of herpetic process. Um, nothing changed any of that. So it was uh, decided to do a full laboratory workup um, everything was within normal limits. Um, and so kind of the working diagnosis through most of her visits down to see this cornea specialist was nodular scleritis, interstitial keratitis. I'm not saying that that's what it is, but just kind of as an idea of what they were thinking. So they decided to do a biopsy of it. Um, so they did it about 10 weeks after she presented, after she had tried all these oral and topical therapies. And then postoperatively, and I'll go through the operative report next, but she was on uh, she was on Durazol twice a day, Allevro uh, daily, and then uh, Best Advance for the first week. She did a long Durazol taper and was on it for about six, to, six weeks to two months after um, the procedure was performed. But this is, this is, I basically copied this straight from the operative report. The conjunctival was pulled back, the lesion was resected with a crescent blade until it was flushed with the surrounding cornea square, and then, you know, he said, it seemed that there was some kind of yellowish lipid mat underneath, and this was taken in its entirety. Um, 
but you can see the patient provided a post-operative photo. Oh, and here's the pathology report. This is once again taken. It was not read by an ophthalmic trained pathologist, but there was this benign screenous epithelium with subepithelial nodular collection lymphocytes, histiocytes, endothelial cells, and stromal cells. There were some markers that were um, that were done. Some of the um, B markers, I, I I didn't include them in here, but everything was negative. Um, any kind of markers they did. Um, post resection, you can actually appreciate. It's kind of blurry because it's a cell phone photo, but you can see here. It's a lot different looking than what we're seeing today. There is still this yellowish material at the limbus, partially onto the cornea. But you know, compared to today, that's quite a bit different. This is about a year later. And so uh, we're bringing it today because we don't really know what this is. There's some things on our differential diagnosis, um, infectious things we were thinking about. We do know that she was on Durazol for two months postoperatively, never had any kind of you know, infections appearing thing go on, so we think that's pretty low. Congenital, you know, when we first looked at it, I thought, was this a limbal dermoid? Those typically don't recur like this, and it, it really only started a year and a half ago. Inflammatory things, I'll go into uh, a couple, one, one diagnosis that I'm, I'm not proposing that this is, but just food for thought. And the neoplastic, there has been a, I didn't include photos because I couldn't get permission, but there was a, there was a case report of benign um, uh, lymphoproliferative hyperplasia, bioreactive lymphoproliferative hyperplasia with corneal involvement and it did have a fairly, you know, kind of similar to appearance to our patient, but that patient also had, lymph had follicles, kind of classic for um, lymphoproliferative hyperplasia and had oh, completely opaque corneas and required uh, keratoplasty. And when they did pathology, there were, there were germinal centers and all kinds of things suggestive of that. Um, but we also, you know, thought is this some, sometimes you can get CIN that looks like this, um, not quite like this, but you know, we're, this was all in our differential. One thing I just wanted to bring up, because Dr. Lin actually had a recent case, is this thing called epibulbar nodular fasciitis, sometimes just called nodular fasciitis of the cornea, but it's a benign fibroblastic growth. There are only about 23 cases total in eight case series um, published in the literature. It's thought to be associated with trauma and inflammation. A lot of the case reports are associated with floppy eyelid syndrome, which our patient doesn't have, have. But the thing that is kind of classic is you have this really rapid growth. A lot of times the people, the treating physicians were concerned about some kind of malignant thing, but it's almost always just this kind of mixed myofibroblastic fibroblastic tissue on um, pathology. Um, I was fortunate enough to know two people who provided case reports. The top one is kind of a really striking example out of Cleveland Clinic, but you can see this is a huge nodule on the cornea that was resected multiple times. Um, and once again, pathology didn't show anything malignant. It was just kind of myrofibroblastic growth. And then this is our case that was about a year and a half ago. But you can see here at the limbus, there's this elevated lesion. This patient didn't really have any pain with it. Just kind of showed up. No history of trauma in this case. But you can kind of appreciate it. It's harder to see on here, but it is a little bit yellow, you know, kind of sameish yellow color as our patient at the limbus. But, but like I said, we, we really, you know, include this in our differential, but once again, our patient has no history of trauma. She has a co chronic contact lens wearer, but wears them appropriately, but they are the very high correction soft contact lenses. So our kind of, we thought about treatment options because it is nearing your visual axis and it's inducing a lot of astigmatism. Um, number one is observation. It seems like it got worse after she had an excisional biopsy. We thought about doing cryotherapy at the limbus to, shut off maybe if there's some feeder vessels. Um, more extreme things would be a complete decisional biopsy. You'd want to get ultrasound before we even consider that to see how deep this actually is. And then we thought about doing a maybe like a partial repeat biopsy and using mitomycin C afterwards. Um, but we just wanted to bring it to here to get some expert opinion because, like I said, we just are not entirely sure um, what we think this thing is. So I appreciate any comments or thoughts if anyone has any. I'll, I'll just show the lesion again. Ooh, this is a, <clears throat> you know, obviously a fascinating lesion, uh, very concerning. Uh, let's see where some of the residents. So, so uh, first of all, as you look at it carefully, the sit lamp, and where is most of this change occurring? Tara, where is most of this change occurring in, this, uh, in the cornea? Is it superficial? Is it deep? It seems like it's like deep or in the stroma. Yeah. 
Yeah. In fact, <clears throat> the superficial cornea as you get out towards the head looks, looks really normal as does the epithelium. And, and so this is something that you can follow as you get along to the front of it. I and mean, this is right at decime. So I, I'm, and you, you gotta have to tell me that this is going, this is mainly posterior cornea where these changes are occurring. And this is going right down but to get it. So uh, I know Francis Ma is a, he's a good friend and uh, an outstanding uh, corneal specialist. I mean, I have a feeling as what he was removing was some of this thicker superficial change, which I think is <laughs> likely secondary. And so the pathology may not really have gotten to, you know, to where, where this is. But uh, I've learned, I mean, th those are the kinds of reports you see from a, uh, you know, a non-ophthalmic pathologist. And I, I've often that kind of stuff is just almost meaningless. And nothing should be done until we get the slides and we get the specimens and have Nick look at this in detail and try to give us a better idea of what we're dealing with on this. But that's the problem. And most of the things we deal with, uh, be, it, be it CIN or be it you know, uh, stem cell failure or the rest, isn't deep in the cornea. It's something you can usually superficially take out, whereas most of this change is coming in extremely deep. And if, you're, and, and if we, we know it's a, a lesion that, that's somehow scary and otherwise can't be treated, I mean, this is going to require a full thickness corneal uh, resection in order to get rid of all of it. So the other important thing is, is we keep talking about it, it's yellow. What, is it, what does it mean that it's yellow when you see something like that? I mean, what, what does that tell you? It could be lipid deposits. Yeah, yeah. So don't, I mean, anything that's causing new vessels to grow that are not fully formed and fully mature will leak lipid and that causes a yellow change. So that's, that's a nonspecific and it, all, it, all it's telling you is, is that you've got immature new vessels that are growing and that crystalline stuff you see right, right along the edge, that's, that's what it looks like and then it gets thicker, it, it turns out and it's yellow in that particular area. So uh, often what you do on these tough ones is you try to first of all decide, you know, what this isn't, and um, you know, the, the, obviously the big thing we deal with all the time is infectious, uh, and uh, uh, the, the one area that you think of an infectious as some form of interstitial keratitis, which is really not infectious, it's almost for sure type of an immune reaction associated, and uh, what's, what would be the most common f uh, cause of an interstitial keratitis? In association with an infectious agent. Herpes simplex. What's that? Herpes simplex. Um, no, nah, chicken pox would probably be, you know, chicken pox, a deep, a deep interstitial keratitis would be number one. Herpes can do a bit of everything. You can always hear that in the differential. So, uh, you know, we've we got to think about that, that any of that IK associated with those is, is a form, however, of a, an inflammatory reaction. It's not infectious at that point. So, uh, out and out infectious, extremely unlikely. We, we're not seeing any other signs of that. Typically, that is going on a lot faster. You're gonna see a lot of vessels that are engorged. And, and, and so I think we can kind of rule that out. Uh, some type of neoplastic, some lymph, <coughs> I mean, if it is, it's most likely a, some type of a lymphoproliferative would be my guess. And Nick, don't you agree? That's gotta be sitting on that list pretty well, some type of a lymphoproliferative. You know, I'd love to see the pathology on this because I haven't seen anything like this before. This is very yeah. interesting. And, you know, it certainly doesn't look like a superficial pathology that's invaded deep. And so it doesn't look like CIN or variants of CIN no, that no, we've no, seen before. It just doesn't look that way. And, you know, with it deep, yeah, look at that. I mean, I mean that's, definitely, look at that. that's definitely deep right there. Uh, if they did just a superficial biopsy, we may have missed the path completely. Totally. So it'd be good to look at it and, and see. But, um, you know, with a deep lesion like this, you know, the differential that Dr. Olson was talking about, some kind of infectious or inflammatory reaction secondary to that. In terms of lymphoproliferative, I've not seen a lymphoproliferative lesion in the deep corneal stroma before no, either. No. So, we're, we're in uncharted territory here. This is definitely a neat looking lesion. Yeah. There, there was, I've never seen nodular fasciitis of the cornea either. Yeah. So there was, there was, like I said, one case report is out in Malaysia and this lady had bilateral corneal infiltration from lymphoproliferative. Yeah. And, and they actually had anterior segment OCT that showed, you know, kind of full thickness invasion, but there wasn't, it didn't spare the anterior cornea. So.
and it had that classic salmon patch appearance too so it wasn't you know this doesn't fit in any category no no I, it's, uh, I mean the kinds of things I've seen that are somewhat like it and you know in, in Saudi Arabia we, we quite commonly see pyogenic granulomas and they can come in really deep but but it was pretty obvious that, you know there been there been some preceding lesion uh, they tend to really heap up and be huge on the surface uh, uh, the other thing that you could see growing that's quite deep would be some variation on the dictyoma. That's why I asked really strongly, was there anything there beforehand? Was there any change? Um, and uh, really, you know, I mean, just no evidence that, that there was some really small dermoid or something that was sitting there. I mean, that's an area that I have. So uh, I, I think the key for right now is to find out exactly what it is. And, uh, and relatively rapidly, because this is growing, and it's, it's, it's already affecting vision and it could soon be in the visual axis. So, I mean, I, I think we've we got we to gotta get that, all of those slides and the rest, and, uh, and Nick's got to look through to see if we can come up with at least some area. And if not, then uh, it looks like it's a little thicker and a little easier to get to out of the limbus is uh, uh, to get a, you know, a punch biopsy where we can get down relatively deep to get it out. And then, uh, and then Nick, you know, work with <coughs> pathology about maybe some stains. We'd like to know: is this in the immuno category? Is this in uh, lymphoproliferative? Is this is this in the uh, you know some unusual form? I mean, if it is some type of an unusual malignancy, I mean, this will be the first reported case. I, I mean, I've never, but but it's got to be in one of those categories for sure. And I, one way or the other, we we got to find out because I mean, this could be something that should be treated with low dose, you know, low dose radiation rather than trying to do surgery, or this needs a definitive excisional biopsy, which I think has got to be a full thickness, and you got to get out, and you've and you, and you got to try to remove all of it's there. And, uh, certainly a doable surgery and, and uh, something we've done before, but, uh, you know, this can result in a lot of irregular astigmatism and other issues or problems, but better that than, you know, this thing grow through the visual access, which it looks like it could be doing relatively rapidly. Amy, what'd you think? Any of that help with your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, that case I have with the um, epibulbar modular fasciitis, I think it looks similar to what's going on in the cornea. So when I took that spiral region off, I think it was um, a Interesting. You see how deep this is? I mean, you can see this yeah. right at decimal. Right this at is, decimal. Yeah. So you get this, you really got to go full thickness. Um, I, and I think we need to report back, obviously, but uh, I, the first thing is, is let's ASAP get what pathology we have and, uh, and, 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 you know, let Nick take a look at it. And for those of you who are out and around, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to knock general pathologists. I mean, I mean, they do a good job, but you, you know what we say when there's an exam done by a, a, you know, in family practice or by internist friends, when they put down double ENT w, with WNL, you know, you know what that really means? We never really looked. Uh, they, don't, they don't have a clue what's happening in the eye. And, and general pathologists, I mean, they'll put it in categories, but by and large, they just, you know, don't, don't have a sense. So it's a very, always a good, Thing. I mean, that, they'll tell you, they can sit there and tell you, well, is this cancer or superficial, but it's a really good lesson for you. You know, you, you've got to get this to an ophthalmic pathologist. Um, and the ophthalmic pathologist, the other great thing, once you get it to one, I mean, you're, you're kind of tied into a group. I mean, Nick, you guys share, I know you share stuff all the time with each other. And uh, it, it, it is, it has its own separate area and separate niche. And, and uh, we, we got to figure out exactly what this is so before we can decide just how to treat it. But. Having a general pathologist read IPATH is the equivalent of me looking at a liver biopsy. You know, I mean, you can look it up in the book and say, eh, it looks like this, but um, it really is a, just a different, it's just a different group of, of lesions. And so you'll often get a vague, you know, vague report that says infiltrate with chronic inflammatory cells or something like that, but it really isn't, isn't helpful. So. If we could get the slides right away mm -hmm. and the block too, if you can get that in case we need to do some special stains with that. I, I fear they're too superficial. I fear they probably yeah. 
they were getting secondary changes and they weren't getting right down into where the lesion is. But but let's let's determine that first. And if if we go for a biopsy, you know, out of the lumbus, and we've got to get pretty deep, I think, to make sure we know just where. And that, if that's where it started, I mean, that's that's probably where the money is. But this is this is. I've seen a lot of weird stuff, but this is this is out there in the fascinoma area. So let's let's find out what we're dealing with before we try to treat it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for our patient for coming in today, too.